What I'm going to do today is introduce to you some formalism. And this formalism is really simple on the surface and complex under the hood. Okay? So today I'm going to be introducing to you terms like opacity, terms like cross section. Okay? And the thing about the thing, the thing about cross sections and opacities is that's where all of the physics is hiding. Okay. So you can, you can say, you can, I'm also going to introduce something called optical depth. Now, optical depth is this magical thing that astronomers talk about all the time. But, but today, you'll learn what quantities go into creating the optical depth at the surface. In other words, you'll find out that it's an integral along a line of sight over the opacity. But the opacity depends upon density and the cross sections of absorption. And the cross sections can be influenced by something that we call wavelength redistribution functions, such as thermal broadening, rotational broadening, and pressure broadening. Those are thermal redistribution functions. Okay. Now that I've said all those buzzwords, let's talk about it. Okay. There's a simple equation, which is a solution of the equation of radiator transfer in the case of pure absorption. Now, pure absorption is what we're showing here as an example on the right. You're here, an observer, there's a source that is sending out photons. You're collecting one line of sight of those photons. When those photons enter some gas cloud, they start to get absorbed. They make their way through the gas cloud, and the gas cloud can have varying density along that line of sight. That's what N sub S means. The density as a function of S along the line of sight. And then the photons exit the cloud and you observe the absorption line. And basically the solution to what you will observe is given by this very simple equation. Now this equation is not just a simple static equation, it is a function of wavelength. There's a, there's a, a, a separate equation for each wavelength. That's what the sub lambda means, okay? So if I, I, can, I can get the answer to that equation at say a wavelength of 65, 63, but I also need a solution for it at 65, 64, 65, 66, blah, 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 in order to know what's going on as a spectrum. Photons that come through at 65, 63 are sitting right there in the N equals two to three stage and a lot of them might get absorbed. And so we would say the optical depth for 65, 63 is pretty high. And I'll talk about what that means later. But at 65, 60, you, you're not inside the absorption line region now and you've all been taught if you don't have the right wavelength or energy, you're, not, you're just gonna go right through the hydrogen atoms. Okay, great. They go right through the cloud and have optical depth of zero. Okay. So this equation has to be solved in each wavelength. Or better yet, it becomes a function of wavelength. It becomes an equation that becomes a function of wavelength. Okay, I zero is the incident radiation on the face of the cloud. And I lambda is what you observe coming out the back end of the cloud. Incident radiation at zero, e to the minus tau, the behavior of how the flux is reduced. Okay, so what is the optical depth? The optical depth is the integration from zero to L along this sight line of the opacity, which is a function which can vary along the sight line. Now you've got a complex gas cloud with some kind of density profile, but when you measure this, you're only measuring what you're seeing along the line of sight. So if the density goes up and then goes down, you've got a function of density as a function of that path length. That's all you know. 
you're collecting light, but that's all the information you're getting about that gas cloud is what's exactly along that sight line and nothing more. What is the opacity? Okay, first of all, opacity is in units of inverse centimeters. And it gives you a measure of how much or how, how rapidly photons are removed from the path at a given wavelength at a given position S along the sight line. Now the opacity turns out to be the product of the number density in sub S along that line of sight and something else, something else physical, something that gives rise to absorption. And that is the absorption cross section of the absorbing ion or atom. So it is the product of the number density along the sight line and the absorption cross section. Now the absorption cross section only depends on the atomic physics of the absorbing atom. So it doesn't change along the line of sight to, go, to first approximation, okay? It does not change. Everybody with me? So that's, that's an atomic physics cross-section, and I'll talk about what it is in a minute. It is not spatially dependent. It is, here's the physics of Balmer hydrogens for absorption. Here's the cross-section for a hydrogen H-alpha line as a function of wavelength. I know what that cross-section looks like. That's a function of wavelength. I multiply it by the number density at each position along the line of sight and integrate along the line of sight and voila, I get the optical depth for that photon. Any questions? Okay. So what is the absorption cross-section? It's the effective target area. It's a cross-section, right? Think of it as a little area and as a photon, you're coming at it. And if the cross-sections are small, chances you're gonna hit the target are small. If the cross-section's big, chances are you're gonna hit it, okay? Now that is a silly picture version of a cross-section but that's really what, how it's easy to mentally think of it. But it really has a more complex definition in that it's the power removed from the beam at that wavelength divided by the flux in the beam. It's kind of giving you the, the rate at which you're removing energy out of the flux that's imp is impinging upon you. Okay. So, um, it's a, per, it's a per absorber quantity. So if I give you a cross section, that's only for a single hydrogen atom. And that's why we have to multiply it by the density of atoms to get out the opacity. Okay. So again, the opacity is the number density at position S. The opacity at position S for a given wavelength is the density at that position S times the cross section at that, of that wavelength for that absorption. Here's some examples. Let's look at this row here. This is your classic bound bound absorption, sometimes known as radiative excitation. Let's say this is a Lyman alpha line and Here's the electron spinning around at n equals one and the Lyman alpha photon at 1215.6701 angstroms comes in here and it excites this up to the n equals two stage and is absorbed. What is the cross section for that to happen? It's given right here, okay? The cross section for a photon exactly of 1215.6071 angstroms is equal to, it's about 7.1 or something times 10 to the minus 11 centimeters squared. That's a small target. 
right? That's a small target. So now I know the cross section, if I can multiply by a number density and get out an opacity, if I, if I know, okay. But see, the thing is, is that there's some, there's a little bit of slop in here, which is, from a heuristic point of view, we could say due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, where these energy levels aren't exactly gossamer thin pure. There's a little bit of uncertainty in these energy levels. And because of that, photons that might be at 12, 15, 6, 7, 0, 2 can also be absorbed. Or 0. 0.6705 can also be absorbed. Except that the cross section for that is lower. If you're a photon coming in at 12, 15, 60, 7, 0, 1, you see something that's about 7 times 10 to the minus 11 centimeters squared. If you're a photon and you're coming in and you're at 16705, 0.6705, you're seeing something that's about point, maybe two times 10 to the minus 12 centimeters squared. That, that cross section is 10 times smaller to that photon. Okay. And so you have this cross-sectional shape, which has to do with the behavior of the atomic physics of the electron and the proton strictly and only. And it has this shape, which is a Lorentzian, by the way, and it has a very narrow width. If you'll notice, the width here is about 10 to the minus four angstroms. So really, it really makes a difference whether you're 6701, 6702, 6703. <laughs> Once you get a little further out beyond that, the cross section goes down and you, it goes to zero out here and you're, you'll just pass right through. So this is a cross section. Now, I really wanna know, are there any questions about what we're talking about here? And understanding that it's not just the one energy photon, but a, a small range of energy photons that can be absorbed. And the probability, if you will, is the greatest if you happen to be the central wavelength. And then that probability drops dramatically as a Lorentzian function. We call that the cross section. Okay. Now, let's talk about another cross section what we'll call a continuous cross-section. Here is a situation of radiative ionization. You have your nice N equals one electron doing its thing, and a photon comes in at around 912 angstroms or higher, and it knocks the electron free. Well, there's all kinds of beautiful things that happen here where the photon energy is removed and it's converted into kinetic energy into the gas. So this is, a, this is a true energy transformation from the photon field to the particle field. Now let's look at this. Let's say this photon had a, a wavelength of a thousand angstroms. Thousand angstrom. The cross section for that is zero. Absolutely zero, not close to zero, zero. That photon does not have enough energy to knock that electron free and make it unbound. Same thing with photon energy wavelengths, a little longer, a little longer, or I should say shorter, until you get to 912 angstroms and then you hit the threshold energy, what we call the edge, the ionization edge. At 912 angstroms, you now have energy just enough to make that electron become unbound. That is, has a probability of 6.3 times 10 to the minus 18 centimeters squared. Sorry, not probability, cross section. Bless you, Anna. So there, there, you can think of this as a very, very 10 to the minus 18 centimeters squared cross section target for a 912 angstrom photon to knock that electron off. Okay. Now, we also know that photons that are higher energy, 
Let's say you're a photon with 600 angstroms. So you have even higher energy than a 912 photon, right? So you certainly could come in and knock that electron free and then some, give it some kinetic energy. But the cross section declines as the energy of the photons go up. So if you're a 600 angstrom photon, you see a cross section that's two times 10 to the minus 18 centimeters squared. Whereas if you're 912, you see six times 10 to the minus 18. So a 912 angstrom photon sees a target three times bigger area than a, a 600 angstrom photon. And you might say, why? Why would a higher energy photon have less opportunity to knock that electron off, okay? We'll get into that later. But you can see that this is what, this is a continuum ionization cross-section. This rapid rise is what's responsible for the breaks, the ionization breaks in a spectrum where none of the photons are being absorbed and then all of a sudden, wham, a lot of photons are being absorbed right at one wavelength. And so what do you get in the spectrum? You get a drop, like a Balmer decrement, except I'm showing you the Lyman decrement, the Lyman cross sections. Okay. Any questions about cross sections? They are based upon atomic physics only. Okay. They tell you what, yes, Bryson. I didn't mean, go ahead and finish. I was just. Oh, they tell, they tell you about the relationship of um, photons that will absorb for a given transition. These cross sections are for two exact specific cases. This one is for Lyman alpha, n equals one to two. If I wanted to know what it was for Lyman beta, two to three, it's a different cross section. It will have basically the same shape, but it will be centered at a different wavelength and have a slightly different width. Or the Balmer, H alpha, two to three. It will be a cross section that looks like this. It will be centered at 65, 63 angstroms and it will have a slightly different width that will have the same shape. It might have a different height, like the cross section might have a different peak level. You see, so each transition has a cross section and each ionization has its own continuum cross section. This one is for Lyman alpha absorption, or I should say Lyman hydrogen absorption. There's also one for, if I have an N equals two Balmer hydrogens, I have also a different cross section. It looks very much like this. The peak is different. The, the behavior of the wavelength decay, slightly different, but it looks pretty much qualitatively the same. So each transition has its own cross section. So is this um, the the shape? And I, I know I've seen this before, but I don't quite remember uh, the shape of this uh, cross section for the break. Is that's what governs uh, the recovery from like the Balmer break or the Passion break? Yes, and I don't know if it's in this uh, lecture or not, but I show later. Uh, several Lyman alpha breaks as a function of column density. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay, I know that plot. Okay, and so that one, that one shows the recoveries. And yes, it, that's because as as the cross section drops to zero again, you can see that the photons now uh, don't get absorbed, right? And so you get you you you're coming along, you get to nine twelve angstroms, wham! All these photons are getting removed, and then as you go out the the cross section's decreasing, and so the spectrum starts to climb back up because those photons are making it through. More of those photons are making it through down here at 200 angstroms or 600 angstroms than they are at 912 angstroms. Anyway, I have a picture of that coming. This is the optical depth, the um, opacity, and then the integral of opacity along the line of sight. And uh, in a sense, uh, we want to say that if if the opacity doesn't change a lot along the line of sight, you can sort of, what I want to do is just assume the gas cloud is kind of a, 
a constant across the gas cloud. It's a, it's a very smooth, constant density, constant opacity gas cloud. Then it turns out that one over the opacity is the mean free path of the photons. So if you think of this average situation where a, a, a uniform cloud could be the mean opacity of the cloud times the, the length of the cloud, uh, the depth of the cloud L, then uh, you can substitute in this equation into this equation and, and get the tau is equal to the length of the cloud divided by the mean free path of the photon. So really when you look at it now, these are both units of length, so tau is unitless, and tau now is a number that is equal to the number of mean free paths that a photon has to traverse in order to get out the backside of the cloud. And so that's what this diagram is showing here. You can think of some cloud of length L, and if the mean free path is this L sub lambda, then you would say, I got one, two, three, four, five, and a third-ish mean free paths in order to get across this distance L. And so my optical depth is 5.3. Now that's a really important intuitive thing to, to really understand. So when you hear about, well, oh, the optical depth of this photon is five, then you know that the, the path length that had to get through the cloud is, is five mean free paths. I think that's a really good intuitive thing to understand about radiative transfer. Okay, so let's move on. Um, here's all, you know, I, I'm giving you all these different forms of the way the optical depth can be computed. It's just a matter of which formalism you choose to use, whether you choose to work in opacities or whether you choose to work in densities and cross sections. The densities and cross sections are actually more, more uh, uh, lower level. They actually are more descriptive. Opacity is the product of those two. So when you break out the product into its components, you know, you're, you're looking at more detail. Um, so uh, here's again the cross-sectional shape. Here is the radiative transfer equations for pure absorption. And so this is an idea here where you're coming in with some intensity into some cloud of thickness L. And let's say you're a wavelength of uh, 12, uh, 14 or something like that, all right? And you, you, your, your optical depth is a half, which means that you, the cloud is only, um, see that's the number of free, mean free paths. The cloud is half as long as the mean free path of the photon. So that means these photons probably have a good chance of getting out the backside, okay? And so in, it turns out that the relative intensity of these particular wavelength photons will be about 0.6. And if they're at this wavelength, then here's your 0.6, right? And here's your wavelength. Or you could see you're, you're uh, have a wavelength that's a little bit closer to where the cross section's higher. And so your optical depth is one, you have a whole mean free path get through the cloud. Then basically the uh, ratio of the emergent intensity to the incident intensity is gonna be one over E uh, 0.367. So this at this wavelength corresponds to a, fl a flux, relative flux of 0.367. Again, you could go to, to another wavelength that's a little closer to the line core and the optical depth might be two, which means it has, has to get through two mean free paths to get through. So a lot of them do get attenuated. They don't make it through that second mean free path. And so the relative intensity is 0.135 and you're down here in the line core. And then you could be even closer to the center of the line core where the optical depth is four. So these photons, one, two, three, four, so you can see the, re the rate at which they attenuate, not very many of them make it out the backside of the cloud, 0.018 relative intensity. And so you're down here in the line core. And so basically what I want you to understand is that optical depth is a function of wavelength. And the way that the line shape is gonna depend on is, is because of this, 
wavelength dependence of the cross section. The wavelength dependence of the cross section makes the optical depth have a wavelength dependency. And so as we go from areas here, we have low optical depths and we're in the line wings. And when we get to wavelengths that are more toward the center of the cross section, the optical depth is greater, fewer photons make it through and you're in the line core. You know, these are wavelengths that are in the line core. So this is the relationship between the cross section and optical depth and the radiative transfer solution. Okay. Um, we can use the optical depth and um, the column density to try to understand some geometry and density of the cloud. And this is another thing that's really good if you're gonna get into especially absorption line spectroscopy that when you, when you know the column density of something and you have some feeling for this density, you instantly have a feeling for the size of the cloud that it went through. And that's really important to, to know. Like all the time, for example, it's like, I, there's these things called damp lamin absorbers. I know that the damp lamin absorbers typically have densities about 0.1 atoms per, per um, cubic centimeter. And I know they have column densities that are like 10 to the 21. So I can just divide it and say, oh, that cloud size has to be on the order of 10 to the 22 centimeters in length by just taking the ratio of those two. And so I instantly know something about, hey, that's about, a, you know, that's like a thousand kiloparsecs or, or I'm sorry, a, a kiloparsec. So um, anyway, that's one of the things I'd like you to walk away with from today's lecture is the ability to do that. Okay, so what do we have here? Um, optical depth, integral of density along the line site times cross section. Um, now, we've already said that to a good approximation, these atomic cross sections do not depend upon where you are in the cloud along this integral. So you can pull them out of the integral and now you just have an integral uh, over the density along the line of sight, over the density. And it, that integral is the, what we call the column density. Okay, it's basically the density integrated along the column of the sight line and it's called capital N. And so yet again, you have another form that you can write the optical depth, which is the column density times the cross section. Okay, now the reason the column density is so useful is because we don't know the size of the cloud. So we don't know the limits of our integral and we don't know the density in the cloud right? So those are two unknowns that we don't know, but we just couch the, those two unknowns together into a single unknown that we call the column density. And later on, we're going to find out that you can, you can extract the column density directly from an absorption line. And so that's great. Now, all of a sudden, it would, if you can extract the column density straight from an absorption line, then you immediately um, have an understanding of the product of the density of the cloud and the size of the cloud. And so that's what this down here is, is telling you. If you just do the unit analysis, the number of atoms cubed um, here per cubic centimeter times the path length, okay, uh, is equal to the column density. I didn't show the math here, but you can imagine if, if N was constant and didn't vary along the line of sight, then guess what? You can pull it out of the integral, right? It's a constant. And then you integrate from zero to L over DS and you get L. So N equals N times L if the density of the cloud is constant. And that's really, really useful stuff uh, because if I can measure this from an absorption line, then I know this product. And then if I've done enough astronomy and astrophysics in my life that I kind of know what the rough densities are of certain types of clouds, then I can instantly have a feeling for how big the cloud is. And that's a beautiful thing to be able to walk around and have the feeling or the intuitive knowledge of what you're looking at rather than just some mysterious number like a column density. Uh, if you just just take your intuition the next level and say, hmm, geez, if that 
cloud had a density of 10 to the minus one atoms per cubic centimeter, then I can estimate the cloud to be about a parsec in length. And so you get a feel for how big that thing is out there. And that's really a great thing as an astronomer to be able to visualize. Okay, I'm gonna pause again, any questions? Okay, are you ready for the next layer? <laughs> I know it's like, oh my gosh, this slide is like packed with stuff. Um, so this optical depth here, as we've talked about it so far, is the density of the absorbers along the line of sight times the cross section. Now here's a problem. That only works if all of the atoms have no motion relative to you. So far, we've been talking about a gas which has zero temperature, <laughs> that the atoms are all at rest with respect to you. But what happens if the light's coming through toward you, but some of the atoms, but the clouds moving toward you? Or what if the cloud is moving away from you? Or better yet, what if the cloud has thermal motions and some of the atoms are moving toward you and some are moving away from you? Okay. And so you get Doppler effects going on. Now, what we call this, when you have something that's going to change the shape of an absorption line profile, we call it wavelength redistribution function. Okay. And one of the, the most common wavelength redistribution function that happens is what we call the thermal broadening function, okay? It's due to the random motions, thermal motions of the atoms in the gas cloud. Now, this notation might seem a little bit uh, overkill for you, but it's to demonstrate that it can be very complicated, more complicated than uh, it allows the formalism to be expanded when the cases get more complicated, which they will when we get further down in the class later and talk about other forms of redistribution functions that affect line shapes. So this form is meant to be general so that we can apply it later, even though it's a little complex for a thermal redistribution function. Uh, the form of it is that it is a function that changes with position along the line of sight in the cloud. That's what the S is for. That it is going to cause a wavelength redistribution. That's what the delta lambda is. Okay. And sometimes it can cause a large delta lambda. Sometimes it can cause a small delta lambda. And it's a function of some parameters, a vector of parameters. It could be a function of temperature. It could be a function of mass. It can be a function of, you know, um, chemical composition. So that is a bold face A in order to indicate that the function could have multiple parameters that are involved with it. Okay. And then the, what you have to do to get the final optical depth is you have to convolve the, the atomic cross section with the redistribution function. So here, this in square brackets is showing you that in order to get out the true optical depth, you take the atomic cross section here and you convolve it with the wavelength redistribution function. And that gives you a new sort of total effective cross section, if you will. You basically are, have taken something like a Lorentzian and then you convolved it with a Gaussian and turned it into something else, okay? Uh, and so you can see that the formalism doesn't change. It's just that what we call the cross section now has been changed, its shape has been changed. Okay, the, in the case of thermal redistribution, the parameter is called the Doppler width, delta lambda d. Okay, and delta lambda d depends upon the temperature. Okay, the functional form of the redistribution function, and we're gonna ignore, the, we're gonna assume that the gas is isothermal, so we're gonna drop out the S dependence. If the gas wasn't isothermal, 
let's say it got hotter from one side of the cloud to the other, we'd have to account for S still. But right here, we're gonna say it, that the, it's an isothermal cloud, so we drop the S, and we're gonna say F of thermal, uh, that's gonna create a given delta lambda is the free parameter or the, the parameter is delta lambda D is equal to this Gaussian function. So this is when you have thermal broadening along a given axis, one axis direction, it turns out to be a Gaussian, a distribution of particle speeds in your, um, toward you and away from you. The delta lambda D is the uh, temperature dependence. Okay, you, you can see that the area of this when you integrate it is gonna be unity because you, your redistribution function has to have an area of one or you actually would change the amplitude of your cross section when you convolve and you don't wanna do that. Delta lambda D is basically two KT over N square root. I know you've seen that before. Um, times lambda naught, which is the wavelength of the transition divided by the speed of light. Okay. Uh, sometimes this quantity um, 2kt over m square root is just called b, the Doppler pr parameter. So it defines the Doppler velocity of, this, of the, um, of the uh, redistribution function is 2kt over m and sometimes we just call that B, the Doppler parameter, okay? And so uh, B typically has numbers, uh, values on the order of five to 20 kilometers per second. That tells you that your, your gas uh, particles are moving uh, with average speeds along the line of sight around five to 20 kilometers per second. Um, this M is the mass of the absorber. Okay, so if we're talking about hydrogen absorbers, hydrogen absorption lines, that's the mass of hydrogen. If we're talking about iron absorption lines, that's the mass of the iron, okay? T is the temperature of the gas. So here are some examples. Um, this is hydrogen only for three different temperatures. This is the velocity dispersion and, and delta, uh, the B parameter or the Doppler velocity width here is the, is the um, sigma of these Gaussians. So here's 10,000 degrees. And then at 25,000 degrees, you can see that the width is greater, but the area under the curves are unchanged because they're normalized. And then at even hotter at 50,000 degrees, it's even broader, this line here, okay? But what if you do the same temperature for different mass? Uh, this shows you the temperature dependence for a fixed mass. It shows you the temperature dependence for a fixed mass. This panel shows you the mass dependence for a fixed temperature. So here's 50,000 degrees. So and hydrogen, this dotted line, you can see it's very, very broadly spread out. Those atoms are moving really fast, okay? 30 to 40 kilometers per second. Uh, because of this temperature of 50,000 degrees. But say carbon is uh, heavier, it's 12 times heavier, so M is 12, and you can see now that that has a narrower uh, velocity dispersion. Iron having uh, 56, um, I think is iron, right? It's 26 and I think it's 56. Uh, you can see the dotted line, it's very narrow. So in the same gas, let's say you have a gas cloud that's 50,000 degrees. The hydrogens are gonna be moving around with speeds of 30 to 40 kilometers per second. But the iron atoms, they're only gonna be moving around say on the order of a few kilometers per second, like five, six kilometers per second. Now that's pretty interesting, isn't it? Yet the gas is thermalized yet the heavy particles are moving around slowly and the light particles are moving around rapidly. And the line of sight dispersion of those particles is a Gaussian. So when you convert that speed distribution into a wavelength uh, redistribution function, this is what the lower panel is. And you can see here that uh, hydrogen for the same three temperatures showing, it's basically the same uh, shapes it's just, this is this is in terms of the wavelength 
shift uh, because of the Doppler shifting. And then same thing with the same temperature, but different mass. You can see that there's a, a huge broadening effect for hydrogen lines and a much narrower broadening effect for iron lines. Any questions? Okay, so one of the things you have to do to get out an optical depth is you have to convolve the wavelength redistribution function with the, with the natural atomic cross sections, okay? And that then, that convolution then goes into your integral. You do this convolution and then it goes into your integral that you integrate to get the optical depth. And these A's are usually parameters about the properties of the gas that you're interested in. For example, in this case, A is equal to this delta lambda D, which tells you it's a function of temperature. So and basically you can use an absorption line shape and, and you can try to determine the temperature of the gas from it. Okay, this is a really important figure. If you want to understand absorption lines, this is your go-to figure. And this is something I put together that I really think uh, is a good iteration toward trying to show this. I think, I think in the future, I might be able to do a better job of it, but I feel like this kind of puts the whole potato on one plate. Okay. So we're going to talk about an absorption line in four stages. The first stage is our atomic cross sections. Okay. Now I'm showing them in log space. So it looks a little bit different because I'm showing the log of the cross section. Now this is the atomic cross section. Remember that that is a very narrow cross section. And in fact, it has velocity widths that are less than this, this, this width up here is about 10 to the minus four angstroms. And the wings down here only go plus or minus 0.01 angstrom. This is a gossamer thin narrow cross section in wavelength. So just because I spread that panel out, don't be fooled. That is like less than a hundredth of an angstrom width. That, that profile, it's very, very narrow. This is to show you that, you know, when we say you've got to have just the right energy to cause an absorption, <laughs> now you can see, see why those cross sections are very narrow. And in this panel, we're gonna have the wavelength redistribution function and assume it's thermal. These are Gaussians, okay? So you can see this is a Gaussian shape. And we're gonna assume all of the same temperature Okay, we're just going to assume some temperature. I think I assume 20,000 degrees or something. And then we're going to take the redistribution function and we're going to, we're going to multiply its amplitude by the column density. And so basically what we're saying is I've got a, I've got a redistribution function of the way the atoms are moving along the line of sight, but now I'm going to say but along that line of sight, my total column density to atoms is going to be 13.5 in the log, 10 to the 13.5 column density of atoms. And if I do that, then my re I normalize my redistribution function to the column density of the gas, then that function uh, goes from about minus two to two angstroms. It has a width here of about one angstrom, uh, Gaussian, full with half max, or I should say sigma. And you can see that its values go from 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, one and a half times 10 to the 13, and then come back down. Now, if I have the same temperature gas, the shape of this line is the same, but if I increase the column density of the gas, either by increasing the density of the cloud or making the cloud bigger, then it's the same redistribution function, except its amplitude is now increased by the column density. Okay, 
And then here's a very, very, very high column density cloud, 10 to the 20. And you can see now the redistribution function of the particles and their move velocities back and forth. But we're in a really thick cloud now. So the amplitude of this is like 10 to the 19, 10 to the 20. All right, so let's go back up to this guy here. This is a small cloud, okay? Um, it has some atomic atoms that are absorbing. Uh, the, re the distribution of the atoms and the, and the size of the cloud and density are such that this is what the redistribution function looks like. When I convolve these two together, okay, I convolve them, I get out this function here. Little Fourier transform for you. This is the optical depth. I performed this integral here at each wavelength. So actually you have to perform this integral at each wavelength so you can get out what's going on at each wavelength. So I perform that, that integral at each wavelength and I get out this profile, the optical depth. Now notice that the optical depth uh, has a, what, this is a Gaussian core, and these are the wings that came from this profile here. And we call those Lorentzian wings. I'll get into more of that later. But this is what the actual optical depth profile looks like. If you could take this and plot it as a function, that's what it looks like when you plot the log of it. Okay, so um, what we're going, what I've done here is I've said, let's, let's take all the optical depths that are greater than 0.1 and I, I made the line thicker. And I'll show you why. Okay, here we have, we now take the optical depth and we take e to the minus the optical depth as, at each wavelength and we get out now our absorption profile. This is the radiator transfer solution. So if you take this profile and you calculate it at each wavelength to get out the absorption profile, this is what you get. And if you, this area that's dark here is the area that's dark here. Okay. So if actually, uh, if you remember, e to the minus tau of 0.367 is an optical depth of one. So an optical depth of one of would have brought this line down to here. But this is an optical depth of about 0.8. So it's here about 0.8 in the line core, and it brings you down to e to the minus 0.8. Okay. But the as the optical depth gets away from the line core and gets lower, you get into the wing of the line and the flux decrement is smaller. But once you get down into these regions here, the optical depth is so small that effectively e to the minus tau is, is one. You know, e to the minus, if tau is 10 to the minus four down here, e to the minus 10 to the minus four is basically one. So guess what? There's no flux decrement. That doesn't mean there isn't any optical depth out there. There's still some atoms out there, but they're just not detectable. You have to have optical depths greater than about 0.1 to really start to see absorption happen in a spectrum. So this is really showing you that you're only getting, you're only getting absorption from the core of that redistribution function. If you go down to 10 to the 15 now, we're gonna be in a bigger cloud, still moving particles around, but a much bigger cloud, okay? Now we see the optical depth is elevated. The shape is exactly the same. This shape and that shape, they're exactly the same, just the amplitudes change because we're in a bigger, thicker cloud. Now the optical depth at the peak is around 10. Optical depth of unity is out here at about 0.25 angstroms out from the line core. Optical depth of 0.1 is out here at about 0.4 angstroms from the line core. 
So what does this line end up looking like when you use this function here? It ends up looking something like this. Okay. So clearly if you take e to the minus 10, you get a number that's like 10 to the minus three in the line core. So it looks like zero to you. It looks like no photons have made it through. It's what we call a black bottom line. And you can see these wings here are due to these wings here. And then once you get down to optical depths that are, are not really, that are so, dis, so small that the radiative transfer equation shows no, de, no decrement in the absorption line. Okay. I know this is, yes, Harrison. Uh, I missed the term you called uh, when it flattens at the bottom is a black something. Yeah, sometimes we call that a black bottom. Or oh, a black bottom, bottom. okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's just a colloquial term used amongst spectroscopists. That, you know, oh, it's a black bottom, or you know, or it's a flat bottom, or inverted flat top, or little cute words like that. All right, now I'm going to show you where you get damped wings and absorption lines from. And a lot of people don't understand this. Even astronomers that have been practicing astronomy for years that if they're, if they're like astronomers who do a lot of imaging and photometry, I'm not saying they're not great astronomers, but sometimes even some of the top flight astronomers, you know, haven't really thought about where a damping wing comes from in an absorption line, okay? Consider a very, very thick or big cloud, okay? Same temperature as our other clouds, but now it's gonna be a big monster cloud has a huge column density of 10 to the 20 atoms along the line of sight. The density multiplied by the, the length of the cloud is 10 to the 20. When you do this convolution of the atomic cross-section and the redistribution function of those atoms because of their thermal motions, you get this optical depth profile. Notice that the peak here is 10 to the six. The optical depth in the core of the line is 10 to the six. Now that means that those photons have a mil, it takes them a million, the cloud length is a million free paths to get through. Those photons don't have a prayer to get through. They would have to avoid getting absorbed over at least a million opportunities. Okay. Now, the other thing, the reason this profile looks different in shape to these guys is only because the scale has been expanded. If you were to look at this profile from minus 1.5 to 1.5, which is this little area down here, it would have the exact same shape, okay? What I'm trying to tell you is the shape of this is the same as this, but this is on a much broader scale, so that's been smashed and you can't see it, okay? The shape of this is unchanged. It just looks different. This is the Gaussian core, 10 to the six. So at the line center, e to the minus 10 to the six is effectively zero, right? So no photons are barely making it through. As you go out here in the region, say plus or minus two angstroms, you're still at huge optical depths of like 10 and above. So you're still knocking out all the photons. They, they, you, even at two or three angstroms off from the side of the line center, because of the thermal redistribution and because the cloud's so thick, those photons still require 10 mean free paths to get through the cloud and therefore hardly gonna make it through and you're still have almost 100% flux decrement down here. But as you go out here, you can see that we're now getting into the Lorentzian, these things here, we are way out them. This is minus one, minus, we have Lorentzian wing here at minus one, minus one is right here, okay? Even right there, the optical depth is greater than one. And so you start to see the shape of that Lorentzian wing kicking into the line and causing this, what we call damping wing. 
And so all the way out here to 10 angstroms to either side of the line core, we have optical depths that are 0.1 and greater. And so we have a discernible line all the way out for optical depths great, greater than 0.1. And this is catching these wings that are here in the Lorentzian through the convolution. And you get these damping wings. So really the damping, all people don't appreciate this. The optical depth profiles always for for pure thermal broadening redistribution, okay, if you only account for thermal redistribution, your optical dust profile all have the same shape. The amplitudes depend upon the column density of the cloud, how big it is or how dense it is. And so basically your, your line shape just depends upon the amplitude of this optical depth function. And the amplitude, if the column densities get huge, the amplitude gets so high that even these weird Lorentzian wings that come from the atomic cross section have, deserve, have large optical depth. So you get these wings. I don't know if I explained that very well, but this is why you get damping wings and large column densities. Sometimes you ask people, why do you get damping wings and large column density absorbers? And they'll say, oh, because the atoms are so close together, they're starting to blur each other out and blah, blah, blah. No, that's pressure broadening. This has nothing to do with pressure broadening. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna pause, any questions? This is a plot that I think if you understand it, you, you end up really understanding absorption lines. Hannah. Oh uh, yeah, so just to confirm, so uh, in the far right column, the absorption profiles, that bottom one, that one is truly like the widest absorption profile. It's just the X axis is scaled differently. Correct, thank you for reminding me of that. These, these are, uh, they go, they go from a two angstrom width, and this goes a 60 angstrom width. So these, these, this profile right here fits in a little, little wedge on this plot. So this is, <laughs> this is a lot of absorption. Even though, the, you know, like the line looks smaller than this one, it, it's... No, if I overplotted this line on here, it would just be this little narrow thing. I know it's wild. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, so the, the pressure broadening would have a different shape if it's being confused with, um, with you know, a damped system. Well, so people confuse it as to why you get the damping wings, but they, and they think it's because of the, the effects that we will call pressure broadening, um, but, one thing that's interesting and about it, if you go back to my previous slides, Mark, where I talk about pressure broadening, I introduce it, you'll notice that the profiles don't look like this. They don't, they're not, they're not flat bottomed. They don't, they're not saturated in the bottom. They actually have the wings and then they kind of do this weird near Gaussian thing and then they come back out with the wings. Okay. Yeah, go look at those in the other slide deck. And that's how you know the difference between pressure broadening and, and what we would call normal damped broadening, right? Right, okay. And then so another point kind of related maybe. Um, the, um, the real observable here is what you're showing on the right, but so you, you'd be able to observe big end, but you're not gonna be able to split out little n or l necessarily is that a fair statement can you repeat that for me okay so I'm, the basic question is what's the what's the f observable or maybe the first level result it's big n you you're not able to split out the little n or the big l is that a fair statement yeah i think the next plots are going to help you understand this question Okay. Uh, you get you can get the column density and the B parameter from 
the profile shape. That gives you the temperature and the column density. But you still don't know, you still don't know the product of density and, and L yet. You have to model the cloud to do that. All right. So let's try it. Let's see. Let's talk about this next slide. Um, so how do you, we talked about line strengths and one of the ways that you measure line strength is something called the equivalent width. And you've probably all heard of it before, but um, you, have, you have an absorption line and now you know what goes on, uh, what has created this absorption line, this product or this convolution of the natural broadening and the thermal broadening. Excuse me, if I take a Lyman alpha cross section and convolve it with the thermal uh, redistribution function of with a B of 15 kilometers per second, and I give the cloud 14.4 column density, I get this profile. I can do this integral here where I take the flux decrement, that's one minus the flux over the continuum here, and I take this flux decrement and I integrate it across the line, I'll get out a number like 0.21 and the units will be angstroms. And so that tells me how much, uh, how much of the intensity was absorbed, it's a line strength. And this black area is showing you the equivalent width. In other words, this is 0.21 angstroms wide and that area under that gray area is the same as the area that's absorbed by the absorption, the equivalent width. Here's another one where I now am going to convolve with the redistribution function of 30 kilometers per second for the B parameter and make the cloud have a column density of 13.8. It turns out that will give me the same equivalent width. Notice that my gray square here is the same area as the area under the line, but the line has a very different shape to it, doesn't it? It doesn't go to zero in the core and it's much broader. So that tells me that the B parameter is bigger because the thermal broadening is greater. So the broader the profile, the bigger the B parameter or the bigger, the, the higher the temperature. And normally the larger the column density, the deeper the line. So you can see that these are, have the same absorption strength, higher column density, deeper line, smaller B parameter, narrower line. Here we have large, smaller column density, not as deep line and bigger temperature, top parameter, broader line, okay? We reduce the column density a little more, crank up the temperature a little bit more, we get an even shallower, broader line, but also 0.21 angstroms. These are all designed to have the same equivalent width or bring down the column density even more, turn the temperature up so we have a B parameter 60 kilometers per second and we get an even shallower, broader line. So the shape of the line really is very powerful. The equivalent width tells you how, how strong the line is, but the shape of the line is very powerful in telling you whether it was a hot gas or a cool gas or whether it's a large column density or a small column density. Okay. This is what we call the relationship of the curve of growth. Okay. The curve of growth uh, is a relationship between, uh, in a sense, the column density or central optical depth and the equivalent width that you measure. So if you have a very small central optical depth, 0.1, then your line core goes down to e to the minus 0.1. That's this line right here. And your equivalent width will be very small, about 0.015. That's the equivalent width there. If you now increase your optical depth, which usually happens by increasing your column density, you might go up to this optical depth of center and you can see what the line shape looks like here. It's, it's deeper because the column density is higher and the equivalent width is larger. So you, you're going up this curve. Here, you're gonna go to, uh, at three, you have a central optical depth of one. This is down to 0.3668. 
uh, flex decrement. And you, your equivalent width is larger. So you're up here with the larger equivalent width. And you can see that you, you are, as your column density or optical depth in the line core goes up, you're, you're having a, a linear growth in your equivalent width. So this is, this is log and this is log and you have a linear growth. See the slope of this is one. So they call this the linear part of the curve of growth because as you increase your column density, your equivalent width increases in direct step. You double your column density, you double your equivalent width. You, you raise your column density a factor of 10, your, column, your equivalent width goes up a factor of 10, okay? But then later what happens is as you go to higher optical depth, you start to saturate in the bottom of the core of the line. And so what happens is this curve turns over and as you go to large optical depths, they have 10, so large column densities, you've saturated here. And so you can't continue to grow your optical depth linearly because as the line's gotten deeper, it's hit a rock bottom here. And so you can't increase the area removed. If you go even to higher, like a thousand for your central optical depth, you're basically now just capturing the wings of your optical depth profile. You started to capture these out here, see? And as this profile gets elevated in amplitude, these profiles just get wider. And then eventually you get to the point where you're on the, the damped part of the curve of the growth that we talked about, where your profiles start to show up and you get flux that's removed in the damping wings. So if you get up to central optical depths of 10 to the sixth, that corresponds to say this line number seven here, you can see that that looks a lot like uh, the plot that we had previously, showing you that the, the, some of the absorptions coming out of these damping wings. And so here is the equivalent width for a 10 to the six. And then if you go even higher, you get this, you can start to see these damping wings really kick in and they could spread over 30, 30 uh, uh, to 60 angstroms. They can really become broad. I mean, an absorption line that's 30 angstroms wide from side to side, that's a huge piece of spectrum being wiped out. And the equivalent width is gonna go up. But notice that the, the slope of this curve is not as steep as the slope here. So we call this the linear part. We call this the flat part because it's fairly flat. And we call this the damped part or sometimes the square root part because the slope here is a half. For a, if you did a, a go up a factor of 10 in column density, then you go up as the square root. Of, of 10 or 3.173 or whatever it is uh, in equivalent width. So this is called the curve of growth. Slope is one. You're growing the depth of the line. Basically, as you go up in column density, your equivalent width goes up linearly with it in the log space or in direct proportion. Here's flat you are just basically increasing the wings. And so the equivalent width grows very slowly. And here you start to get the damping wings and you start to grow as the square root of your increase. Here is a typical curve of growth for lime and alpha line. Now I'm gonna do it in terms of column density instead of central optical depth. And I'm gonna show you how changing the Doppler parameter changes it on the flat part of the curve of growth. And then we'll, we'll, we'll end on this slide today. I, I, I have to lecture faster or we're never gonna get through this class. Um, and you're probably like, no, this is plenty fast, thank you. So this is my natural speed, so we'll probably just stay at it if you guys are good. All right, here's column densities. Remember we did some examples before where we did one at 10 to the 13 and then one at 10 to the 15 and one at 10 to the 20 on that slide where I did the, 
anatomy of the components of a, how you get to an absorption profile. All right, so this is log log, and on this plot, this is a, a slope of one log log, and this is a slope of a half on the log log. See, it's shallower than, than this one. In this regime here, it turns out that the equivalent width scales directly with the column density. Now, I'm showing you this formula, but I don't want you to worry about all these constants right now because later in the class, we'll talk about where they all come from. But the point is that W scales directly with column density. And that's what happens in this part of the curve of growth. Okay. But remember that on this part of the curve of growth, the equivalent width is growing because the, the profile is getting broader. Okay, so if you have a cool gas with a narrow thermal broadening function, you turn over on the flat part sooner. So it'll be a 15 kilometers per second, which might correspond say a temperature of 10,000 degrees or something like that. Actually way cooler in the case of hydrogen, um, about 5,000 degrees. You can see that the equipment width turns over and becomes on the flat part, uh, down here and the equivalent widths kind of are from the flat part at around 0 0.2, 0 0.3 angstroms. But if you have a really hot gas so that the broadening function is very, very broadening, let's say here 90 kilometers per second, this would be like 100,000 degree gas. You could see that the flattening happens out here around one angstrom, okay? And then as you go up in column density, you eventually get to the point where the lines start to converge because you're now being dominated by those damping wings. And then it turns out that it doesn't depend upon the B parameter anymore because these damping wings create profiles that are so wide that the, the broadening of the thermal gas is just a gossamer thin distribution compared to it. Um, so on the flat part, the behavior is that, yes, Harrison? Uh, you, you can finish, it's more of just a quick question. Okay, and I know we got it, we got to end here. Um, the equivalent width scales directly as the B parameter, because remember, this is being broadened by the width. And so it scales directly with the thermal broadening in this region here. And then there's this, functional garbage here that's the square root of the logarithm of, and what matters is the column density divided by the B parameter, okay? So what this is explaining this behavior. As N goes up, the equivalent width goes up, but it goes up very, very slowly, the square root of the logarithm. So as here you are at B equals 30, as the column density goes up, you can see the equivalent width is growing very slowly. But if you are at fixed column density, say 10 to the 16, and you're at B15, B30, B45, you can see that it's very proportional to the B parameter. And so for a fixed column density, you get a much larger equivalent width because you have much broader wings as the B parameter goes up. But notice that these lines converge. And the reason they do is because there's also a B inside here. So as B goes up, this term starts to actually cause an asymptotic um, narrow, uh, convergence of these lines. And so that's what this part here is, is that on the flat part, it goes as B times the natural log of one over B to the square root. So for a fixed column density, these lines get closer and closer and closer together because of this natural log of one over B term. And so this is, this is supposed to be the beginning of the class where I'm just introducing these things to you. Later on, we will talk about them in more detail and we will learn more about them. This is supposed to be a pretty much an introduction to this stuff, but I'm trying to make sure that I get to you all of the really nitty gritty details about it. As I find that when people talk about the curve of growth in a class, they don't really show you all these things that I just talked about.
they just kind of show you the curve and, and tell you the parts. But now, now you understand, now at least functionally, you can understand why these lines flatten and why they converge uh, in Doppler parameter as the Doppler parameter goes up. And that, that is something important to, to really understand when you're a spectroscopist about how uh, gas behaves. And then the last part is the, the uh, square root part. Um, and that is, here's the functional form. And you can see that there's no B parameter. It doesn't give a stitch about the B parameter, just like on the flat part, doesn't give a stitch about the B parameter. But here it goes as the square root of N, thus the square root part of the curve of growth. And that's because of the damping wings and they converge again and don't care about the B parameter. People love damped lamb and alpha profiles because if you measure the equivalent width, you instantly get the column density, right? Because it doesn't care about the B parameter. If I measure the equivalent width to be 10 angstroms, I can just read the column density right off the plot, no matter what the thermal properties of the gas are. Or if I measure the equivalent width and it's very small, like 0.02, I can read this off and go, ah, the column density is 12.7. It doesn't care what the thermal properties of the gas are. What you hate in this world is if you measure an equivalent width of one angstrom, then you're like, uh, it could be it's hot gas with a column density of 10 to the 15, or it could be that it's cool gas with a column density of 10 to the 18. That's three orders of magnitude in column density. That doesn't help me out very much. So then you have to use other tricks to get the column density. Okay, what I'd like to do now is talk about <clears throat> ionization and ionization cross sections and optical depths, okay? So this is a fairly busy slide, but what I'm trying to indicate to you, number one, first and foremost, is the, the radiative transfer equation, in other words, the behavior of the flux decrement and the optical depth is identical formalism. <clears throat> given right here, it's the same formalism. You have an optical depth. It's just not a, a super narrow um, or Gaussian uh, cross-section. It's going to be something that looks more like this um, cross-section, where it's spread over hundreds of angstroms, okay? Now, remember that this is the uh, cross-section for Lyman alpha, not Lyman alpha. Yeah, well, Lyman alpha hydrogen is being ionized. In other words, neutral hydrogens with the electron in the ground state, N equals one. To ionize that electron, you have to have photons that have wavelengths shorter than 912 angstroms because that means they have high enough energy, higher energy than 13.6 EV to, to knock the electron free. Photons that have longer wavelengths have less than 13.6 EV of energy, and therefore they have no opportunity, no physics to knock the electron off. So your optical depth, same formalism as it was before, your radiative transfer, same formalism it was before. The only thing that's different is the cross-section because it's a different physical process. <clears throat> so if you now take this, formalism and use this cross-section, what are you going to get, okay? Well, to a good approximation, um, this cross-section can be modeled or can be expressed as this formula here. <clears throat> and I want you to understand that this is an approximate uh, version of this formula. It is, it is not the true formula. The true formula uh, I've put down here in this box, okay? So if you were to go through and, and solve the quantum mechanical equations for the hydrogen atom and do what are called overlap integrals, integrate over all space and all angles uh, for the upper and the lower states, and in this case, the upper states of free electrons, so it's not exactly simple stuff, and you, you will derive this formula. Um, you, know where I, you know where you can find this derivation? is in a beautiful paper that was published in 1935 by Mensis and Pecoris. And they derived all of the cross sections for hydrogen back in 1935. So here, as I was saying, is the um, 
rigorous quantum mechanical, and then you can show that uh, to a good approximation, you can write it as this here at lambda cube. And so we, we say that roughly that the cross section goes as lambda cubed. Okay, well, I should say as lambda increases, it goes up as lambda cubed. However, uh, there should be a statement here, which I forgot to write, which says that lambda has to be equal to or less than lambda naught, otherwise it equals zero. So this cross section behaves this way. And so you're basically gonna insert that into your optical depth um, equation. And if we follow our old rule um, that the, this is not, uh, I should say, this is not dependent at all on uh, the path length position S, we can factor it out of the integral. So we can rewrite this Lyman limit optical depth as the column density of the neutral hydrogen in the ground state, in the ground state, okay? Um, and we can multiply that by the cross section. And it turns out that at the Lyman limit, that's what LL stands for. See, I've got a lambda knot here. Okay, at evaluated at lambda naught, this equals this constant. And so at, at 912 angstroms, the optical depth is equal to this constant times the column density. And that's really, really nice because that means if you can go to a spectrum and measure the optical depth right at 912 angstroms, bada bing, you know the column density of neutral hydrogen. And I'm gonna show you that in a minute. When you invert this and solve for the, nat uh, the neutral hydrogen column density, you get the neutral hydrogen column density is 1.586 times 10 to the 17 times the optical depth at the limit, 912 angstroms. The log of this number, 1.586 times 10 to 17, is 17.2. And so now, ladies and gentlemen, you know that if you see an ionization break in a spectrum, and the optical depth is one of that break, you know that the column density equals 17.2. So this is a very important relationship because if you can measure the optical depth from the spectrum at 912 angstroms, you get the column density directly. And that, we haven't really talked about why we want the column density, why it's so important. We do know that the column density is approximately the product of the number density and the size of the cloud. That's really good information, okay? But later on, we're gonna find out you're gonna to have to do some ionization modeling and things like that to really get out the physics of the cloud that you wanna understand. Because ultimately, what are we learning here? We're looking at spectra. We're trying to understand the physics of the objects that generated those spectra. This is a very busy plot, but it's a homegrown plot that I wanna show you. I made this myself. You can make one yourself from this slide very easily. You can just write a little program that says, I'm going to write a loop across wavelength, and this is gonna be my cross section and tell me what my cross section is as a function of wavelength, okay? Where A naught is given by this number here. I'm gonna put that in my little integral here, and I'm, well, even easier, I'm going to look at what my uh, spectra should look like as a function of column density, because I can write tau as n sigma lambda. So here's my sigma lambda. I, I calculate that at lambda. I multiply it by some column density that I choose. I get out optical depth. I put my optical depth in, in here, and I get out my flux decrement, and I generate spectra. Okay, so here's the cross-sectional shape. That's this. And um, anyway, if I put in a column density of 10 to the 15 here, so I multiply this function by 10 to the 15 as a function of wavelength, and then I calculate this at each wavelength, I get this right here. Now I've also, for purpose of illustration, I've also put in the hydrogen lines in my little model spectrum. But you can see here at 912 angstroms, about right here, you can see the break. And at 
10 to the 15, you really don't see anything. At 10 to the 15, five, you see a little decrement. And at 10 to the 16, you start to see a little bit of a decrement. Now I could, if I can read that right there, I would say, okay, that's 0.95. So I know that e to the minus tau equals 0.95, right? And so then I could solve for e, I can solve for my tau out of that e to the minus tau equals 0.95. I could solve for tau, and then I could multiply that by 1.587 or whatever it was times 10 to the 17, and I would get the column density out. Now, here is um, 10 to the 16 in steps of 0.1 in the log all the way up to 10 to the 17. And so you can see that the ionization break right here at 912 angstroms is starting to kick in and get deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay. And, um, and again, I would say, oh, my flux decrement is about 0.5. So this equals 0.5. And so I know the ratio of this to this is 0.5. I could solve for e to the minus tau at this wavelength right here. And then I just come back to this equation and plug it in here and I get out my column density. All right, so we can see as the column density gets higher and higher in the log here, 17 to 18, here's 17, that's a repeat of that line, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 6, 7, 8, 18. So interestingly, what do we see here? we see that the flux decrement is 0.368. That's a magic number. That's an optical depth of one, e to the minus one, 0.368. So I know that that's an optical depth of one, and I know that that corresponds to a column density of 17.2 in the log. Okay, so now, since I've done this for years, when I see a, a break in a spectrum and I, I can look at there, read off the flux decrement, convert it to an optical depth and get a column density. And I can do that pretty much all in my head now after years and years of doing this. So it's one of those things that as you, as you get more comfortable with spectra, you start to be able to read them pretty much, uh, not just from their shapes, but you get to convert them into numbers that have some kind of physical meaning. Now, if I know that the column density is 17.2, I know the product of the density and the cloud size. And then, then if I can make a simple assumption, like, oh, I think that the density is 10 to the minus four, um, then I would say, well, the cloud size then has got to be something uh, like 10 to the 21 in centimeters. It's just a matter of multiplying numbers. Okay, as you go, um, this is a, a larger scale plot showing you, of course, uh, above a thousand angstroms, you don't get any um, break. I should say above 912 angstroms here, you don't get any break. Um, here's the, uh, this is interesting. You can start to see the damp lines in the Lyman alpha line. So, this is uh, Lyman alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, and then all the way up and then to n equals infinity, and then you have the break. And so here's 10 to the 17, which is not quite an optical depth of one. And then here's 10 to the 17 and a half. And then here's 10 to the 18. By 10 to the 18, notice that we've gotten saturated at the, at the, at the bottom right there at the limit of 912 angstroms. And so somewhere between 10 to the 17.9, 17.8, 18, uh, we get to the point where we, we get flat bottomed again, we get saturated. So when you see a, a break and it's saturated at the, at the break like that, then you know the column density is probably around 10 to the 18 or more. Okay. And so, you know, I can now, I know these, I know this behavior. So now when I see a break, I'm like, oh, this is sort of in this area. So that's probably about 
I could just read it right off the spectrum. Now to notice that we've got these recoveries here. And Bryson had mentioned that in a previous question that we've probably all forgotten now. But because the cross section decreases here, we can see that photons that have say 400 angstroms, 600 angstroms, their cross section for absorption is smaller. So the absorption at that wavelength is going to be less. And so you can see here that as we go from the peak and the cross section drops, we can see here that we get a our spectrum starts to do something we call a recovery, starts to recover. Okay. And the recovery here goes as lambda to the cubed, e to the minus lambda cubed. Don't forget there's an e to the minus lambda cubed for how it recovers because you have to roll it through the, the radiative transfer solution. Okay. Um, interestingly, if you get really, really, really high column densities, you can have a lot of your spectrum completely wiped out. And sorry about that. So in the case of say 10 to the 20 uh, column density, um, your Lyman alpha is gonna start to have damping wings in it. So that's corresponding to this line here, but you are so wiped out, but if your optical depth is still greater than, I don't know, much greater than at least 10 or so uh, all the way up here. And then your optical depth starts to decrease. And so here around 150 angstroms, the, the cross section times the column density starts to give you a number that is less than about two or three or something. And you start to actually have some flux decrement leaking through. And then um, as you get down here, uh, you recover all the way. One of the things that's really interesting about quasar spectra is that um, you can have a, a, a gas cloud halfway between you and the, and, the, and the quasar, and it might be a huge cloud of the column density, say, of 10 to the 20 or more. And what will happen is it will, your spectrum, you'll have a lot of flux from your quasar, and then your quasar at certain wavelengths just won't even be there. It's wiped out because all of those photons from the quasar are just completely taken away by the neutral hydrogen gas between you and the quasar. And so you can literally take an image uh, in, at say uh, 1200 angstroms or 1100 angstroms and see a very bright object. And then if, if there was a gas cloud between you and the quasar that had 10 to the 20 in column, all this light would be wiped out and absorbed into that cloud, you could take an image, say here at 600 angstroms and you wouldn't see the quasar at all. Pretty wild. They call it a dropout, UV dropout. Now you probably heard about UV dropouts in galaxies, same phenomenon, except in this case, the absorption is due to clouds that are actually in, in the galaxy themselves. So they're very bright, AGN or very bright young stars with a lot of UV light that can ionize neutral hydrogen. The gas cloud in the galaxy that happens to be in front of those stars absorbs all of those UV photons and uh, by ionizing the hydrogen that's in those neutral gas clouds. And therefore the, the galaxy self absorbs all of its UV photons on, on their that are on their pathway to your uh, telescope. And guess what? Um, you get what's called a UV dropout in your galaxy. 